part of the statewide celebration of Oregon Archaeology Month. Before we begin, did you stay and explore the exhibits after the talk? This includes the one here in this room, Gay Rodeo, a celebration of Western rural heritage and gay culture. Gay Rodeo reveals a long marginalized segment of the Western community, blending rural heritage with the courage, humor, and expression of urban gay America. In fact, next Thursday, October 24th at 6 p.m., you can join folklorist Craig Miller on a journey into the history of gay rodeo and explore the values that help unify it as a community. <clears throat> the next day, on Friday, October 25th, we're offering Museum After Hours. If you're tired of adulting, round up your favorite cowpokes and head to the museum for some boot stomp and fun. You'll learn country dance moves led by Craig Miller from a talk the evening before. Get in on some rodeo style competitions. Enjoy food from Falling Sky Brewery and adult beverages, including beer from Falling Sky and some Pinot Noir from my favorite winery in the area, Walnut Ridge, while you explore this new exhibit. Has anybody been out to Walnut Ridge here? Raise your hand. Yeah, so if you like deviled eggs, and if you can eat eggs, who doesn't like deviled eggs? They have the best eggs in the county. They've got this nice bacon jam on them here. Uh, worth going out just for that, uh, apart from their exceptional wine. <laughs> Limited uh, tickets for this event are available. <laughs> Secure your spot and purchase your ticket in advance at the admissions desk. Tickets are $15 in advance for museum members, $20 for the public, and tickets at the door are $20 for members and $25 for the public. This ticket price includes food and activities, and your first drink is on us. Visit the museum webpage at nnch.uoregon.edu for more information or to purchase tickets. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Allison Carter. She is our newest faculty member in archaeology at the UVO, having been hired in the Department of Anthropology in 2017. Dr. Carter received her bachelor's degree in 2001 from Oberlin College, her master's of science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2007, and her PhD from there as well in 2013. Prior to her being hired at UVO, she was a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Carter is a specialist in the archaeology and prehistory of mainland Southeast Asia, particularly Cambodia, and the Angkor civilization, and how commodities such as stone and glass beads help inform on the ways in which peoples interacted, traded, and developed more complex ways to structure society. In recent years, she's also moved toward examining residential patterns and developing a more nuanced perspective of how and when Angkor civilization collapsed, as seen in a recent paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one of the most prestigious science journals in the world, just this year. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Carter, who will be presenting her paper titled Looking Beyond the Temples, Exploring the Ancient Residences of Angkor, where she will discuss recent excavations of Angkorian residences and what they reveal about everyday life in the region. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Carter. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for that very nice introduction. Thank you all for being here today. And you can hear me OK with them? OK, great. Um, I'm kind of a pacer, so uh, if for some reason I stop, like my voice drops out or something, please yell at me. Um, okay, so thank you again for coming and for this introduction. I'm going to talk a bit about my work uh, doing household archaeology in two places. So I started out um, as well as my um, primary uh, collaborator, Dr. Miriam Stark at the University of Hawaii, uh, with whom I've been working since 2005. So um, I just want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, this is a work of a large group of people and couldn't be done without all of their help. Okay, so um, here's the the outline for our talk. I'll give you an introduction to Angkor and uh, explain a little bit more about the society and background, and then we'll talk about how household archaeology can contribute to our understanding of Angkorian civilization and what we know so far about the daily lives of Angkorians. Uh, then I'll present uh, these two case studies about household archaeology at Angkor Wat and then looking outside the capital at this other temple, small temple site called Basite in Bantambang province, Cambodia. Okay, so um, there's actually been people living in Cambodia for thousands of years, 
But to give you a very quick overview of the timeline that we're talking about, um, I'm going to be focusing on the Ancorian period, which is here. And we have, if you notice here, we have Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and then we have this period called the Pre-Ancorian period. We have kind of general dates for those. And then when we get to Ancor, we have really specific dates. 802 to 1431. That's because we have historic documents that give us the dates when supposedly the first king, Jayavarman II, established the Amphorian Empire, unifying all of these disparate polities. And then in 1431, supposedly the Thai uh, Yotian capital sacked Amphor and it fell. But uh, we know from archaeology actually that this is a lot more complicated. And in fact, some of my recent work is showing how complicated the decline of Amphor was. But uh, we won't go into that so much now. Um, we'll just kind of use this as a framework. And uh, we also talk a little bit, of, I'll mention a little bit about the, what we call the post encore period from about the 15th to 17th centuries too. Okay, so when we say encore, when I say encore, we're sometimes referring to different things. So it's good to go over what these different terms mean. So sometimes when we say the word encore, we're referring to a civilization or an empire. And this map here is from the Royal Palace in Phnom Penh. So of course it is showing the greatest extent of the Amphorian Empire. Uh, at its height, the Amphorian Empire perhaps controlled or at least influenced a really large portion of mainland Southeast Asia, so that's what this area is showing here. I'll mention this in a second, but Khmer is the major ethnic group and language uh, linguistic group in Cambodia, and so it's often used interchangeably with Angkor to refer to this civilization. Uh, and then this is the modern nation of Cambodia here, and then the capital is right there. So you can see at its height, it covered this really large area. So sometimes when we talk about Angkor, we're talking about this huge empire. Um, but usually when people say Angkor, they're going to Angkor, or they're going to see Angkor, they're referring specifically to this place in Cambodia, the capital of this civilization that's near the modern town of Siem Reap in Cambodia here, next to this large lake called the Tol Sap Lake. And this is like a tourist map of Angkor. This is where you go to see all of these beautiful temples that are still standing in the region today. So a lot of times when people refer to Angkor, they're really focusing just on this capital area as well, too. Um, I just want to mention, and this is going to animate in just a second here, this little dot right there is where Angkor is. And here is the Tol Sap Lake. And what you'll see is that there's a lot of seasonality in water in Cambodia. And so what this map is showing you is that during parts of the year, the water from the Mekong River is coming down. It also backs up. This is the Tol Sap River that runs into Phnom Penh, the capital down here. And at certain times of the year, the Tol Sap Lake bursts its banks and deposits this huge area of um, all around central Cambodia with water and very good agricultural soil and silt. Uh, so uh, you can see this little orange dot, which is on four, is right on the edge of that floodplain. The Tolne Sap Lake is also one of the world's largest inland fisheries and a major source of protein. So this is actually a really great location to have the seat of your empire because you have good agricultural land, you're right on the edge of a floodplain, and you have easy access to protein. So it's an ideally located place for your civilization. Uh, where I'm going to talk about later is on the other side of the lake and the floodplain over there. Okay. Um, there's another Angkor, and that one is specifically Angkor Wat. And that is a specific temple within the city of Angkor, which is part of the Angkorian civilization. So Angkor Wat uh, is located, you can see this picture here. It's also on the flag of Cambodia. It is by far the most important building, Angkorian building. And one of the most important symbols of Cambodian um, national identity, even today. Uh, it was built in the early 12th century by King Suryavarman II. Here's another beautiful picture of it. It's so pretty. I like to show lots of pictures. And here's an aerial view. So this is also one of the world's largest religious structures. You can see here, this is the temple itself. And it's surrounded by this large forested area, which I'll come back to in a second. And then there's this huge moat. And the moat itself is one and a half kilometers by 1.3 kilometers. So this is a massive temple, just one temple, a state temple, an important state temple in the Amphorian civilization. And just to give you an idea of scale, here we are from Google Earth, the Museum of Natural and Cultural History is here. And if we were to overlay that map of Angkor Wat on top, 
a very large portion of the U of O campus and part of Eugene would fit just inside one temple from this civilization and from this capital. So the scale of the construction during the Amporian Empire in the capital was really quite impressive. So uh, here's another close-up view. This is Angkor Wat, so you can see this is just one temple in a large landscape. There's another Angkor as well, too, on this map. That's called Angkor Thom, and that is referring to a walled city. So this whole area was an urban center, but within that was this walled neighborhood uh, called Angkor Thom. And we associate this with a king named King uh, Jayavarman VII, who uh, constructed this city or formalized it in the 12th century, the late 12th century. He had this huge royal palace area and he had this central uh, temple, state temple called Babayan, and then there's uh, quite a few other temples scattered throughout here, and then around it you can see this nice grid system of mounds where people were living. Just to give you some more pretty pictures, this is one of the gates, entrance gates, to the city of Mont Fort Tom, which is quite beautiful. Um, outside the gates, over the moat that surrounds the city, is a life-size recreation of a Hindu myth called the Turning of the Sea of Milk, which essentially was a tug of war between gods and demons. And so he has life-size recreation of this myth, where one side over the moat is this is the demons, and then on the other side of this are the gods pulling on a giant snake. And those were all from the 12th century. Twelfth century. century, yeah. Um, so, just to recap, when you say Angkor, we mean a few different things. One of them is this civilization or empire, also the urban core that's located near Siem Reap, but then we also want to make sure you're not confusing that with Angkor Wat, which is a particular temple, and Angkor Thom, which is a walled city within the urban core. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Khmer is the language group and uh, language that people speak in Cambodia, and it's also the majority ethnic group. And so, like I mentioned, sometimes people refer to the Angkor Empire as the Khmer Empire as well, too. Okay, so part of my background there. Uh, also, just to uh, frame the research that we're doing now, so it helps to talk a little bit about the research that has been done and why we're looking at the daily lives of people in Angkor. So, when the French first arrived in the late 19th century, they found all of these temples. Um, many of them had been abandoned, but not all of them. And in fact, the idea that Angkor was a lost city that was discovered by Europeans <laughs> is a myth. The Cambodians never completely abandoned it. They never forgot about it. Uh, but there were certain temples that had become overgrown. And so the French, for a large part of the first decades of research in Cambodia, really focused on reconstructing the temples, looking at the inscriptions, understanding who built them and when, trying to understand the art historical styles, and creating, um, I mean, doing a lot of this restoration too, so you can see archival photos of them uh, restoring. This is called Bantier Sari Temple, there. Um, and what they created at the end of this work, which is definitely valuable research, is this list of a nice history, uh, culture history of Angkor, listing the kings and rulers when they ruled the temples that they were associated with. So this is really valuable research, and I don't want to detract from it, but it's also a research that focuses just on the elite members of society. And so that really has driven a lot of the research questions and the type of work that's been done in Cambodia is focusing on the temples, which by default is focusing on elite members of society. So it's important work, but we want to start filling this out a little bit. Unfortunately, as you all probably know as well too, Cambodia suffered from socio-political tensions in the region in the 1970s. And so by the early 1970s, most research in Cambodia had been shut down. Many of the archeologists were leaving. This is a photo of Khmer refugees who fled into Angkor and were staying at Angkor Wat while there was uh, warfare in the countryside. And by the end, of the Khmer Rouge period, only four Cambodian archaeologists in Cambodia survived. That was it. And this is a country with thousands of archaeological sites. So in the early 1990s, there was this massive vacuum in human resources. Lots of archaeology and lots of archaeological sites that needed to be protected and researched, salvaged from war, and there was almost no one left in the country to do it. So, 
The program that I started working with in 2005 was actually asked by the Cambodian government in the late 1990s to come in and help rebuild the archaeology program in Cambodia. Cambodian archaeologists today are trained at the Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh. And so there was a new archaeology program that was rebooted there. Lots of scholars came from outside the country and the surviving Cambodian archaeologists have worked diligently to rebuild the archaeology program. And when I was working, when I first started working with Miriam Stark in 2005, she had a very important training program to help train the next generation of Cambodian archaeologists. The good news is now, uh, like 20 years later, we're in a much better place. There is a whole, um, there's so many dozens of Cambodian archaeologists. Many of them have uh, gone overseas to pursue higher degrees. Um, Miriam's student, P. Paul Hang, is now the second, he just finished his PhD, and he's the second Cambodian archaeologist to get a PhD in the United States in archaeology. So now a lot of people who were her students in the 1990s and the early 2000s are people in the government who are helping um, enforce and encourage research and cultural heritage preservation. So it's really a success story in, in doing archaeology in Cambodia. I will mention, though, that there was this period of about 20 or 30 years where we basically hit the pause button on archaeological research. So we're really playing catch up with what we know about the Amphorian civilization. Other parts of the world have been asking questions about the daily lives of people and doing household archaeology since the 1970s. But we're just starting that work now because of these, uh, because of these issues. <coughs> so this is a map of Amphor that was uh, published in 1979 by Bernard Philippe Bollier. Um, this was one of the last maps of Amphor to be published um, until the country reopened to study. And it's really similar if you I've been to Angkor, if you saw my images earlier, kind of similar to what the tourist map looks like. It really focuses on the central zone of temples, and these large rectangles are water storage features. All of these glass rectangles and squares are water storage features. What Bernard Philippe Rollier had started doing, but his research was aborted, was trying to understand how Angkor fit within its broader landscape. So in this map, he's starting to attempt this, and you can see there's some canals and dikes where he's connecting some of these temples with the broader landscape. He also had identified some kind of isolated temples and mound sites outside of Angkor, showing that the area around the temples was not just empty farmland, but there were people living there too. And this was our best map for a long time. And then in the 1990s and early 2000s, my two colleagues, Christophe Poitier and Damien Evans were able to get back into Cambodia and continue this research. And this is the map of Angkor that was published in 2007. I'll say that Damien has been working on an updated version of this map. So hopefully in the next few months to next year, there'll be a new version of this map that's actually showing even more sites, becoming even more densely populated actually. Um, what's interesting to note here is that this is the part of Angkor that we really focus on, but you can really see clearly it's integrated in a very large landscape. Um, an agricultural landscape, these are mostly rice fields, but there's mounds, occupation mounds, small village temples. There's a huge population of people living here. And the amount of people has been uh, the source of some discussion. Some of my colleagues say that maybe three quarters of a million to a million people lived here. Some people are a bit more conservative, like a quarter of a million people. Uh, this is actually something I'm working with a colleague on now, so hopefully we'll be able to start pin, pin down a little bit more how the demographics and population of Angkor changed over time. But this map is about a thousand square kilometers, and it's just showing you how much the Khmer people transformed this landscape. And that a large part of the daily lives of Angkorians has not really been captured in archeology span yet. If we're just focusing on this central civic ceremonial area, so that leads me to this research question that um, my colleagues and I have been thinking about, which is um, where are these daily, where are these people? How can we study them? What were the daily lives of Amkorian people like? And how did this change over time? How are they integrated into this bigger system? Uh, we have a little bit of evidence from non-archaeological sources that we can talk about. Uh, one of them is this uh, historic document, this book, 
by a Chinese ambassador to Ampur named Joda Huan. He came to Cambodia, he came to Ampur in 1296, and he wrote kind of like a lonely planet guide of Ampur <laughs> for Chinese people, basically. There were a lot of Chinese people who had come to Cambodia and were living in the city, and he was one of them, and he was just commenting on all aspects of life in Cambodia, their way people conducted business, the kind of rituals that people had, the houses that people lived in. So this is a really important document for us as archaeologists. It gives us something to look for in the archaeological record and try and study and understand. And he specifically described how people lived in a house and their house size was related to their status. So richer people had larger houses. The materials that people used to make their houses was also varied depending on their status too. So people who lived, upper class people who lived in large houses would have roofs with roof tiles. So here's a modern example of a house with roof tiles on it. You can imagine that a roof with roof tiles is pretty heavy, so you're gonna need really solid posts and heavy timber to construct these houses. And he said that poor people or lower status people lived in houses with thatch roofs like this one here. So this was very valuable to us because it gives us something to look for on the archaeological record. We could look for places with lots of roof tiles. We could look for really large post holes that might be indicative of the type of house that was constructed and status as well, too. Oh, here we go. Here's my bullet points about Joda Juan. Okay. Um, there are some inscriptions. Uh, so that's a, a historic document written by a Chinese visitor. Um, there's also Cambodian inscriptions that talk a little bit about where people are living. And one of them is from the temple of Taprom. Taprom, I don't know if this is a, a relevant cultural reference anymore, but Taprom is the temple that was in the Angelina Jolie uh, Tomb Raider movie, which not so many people have seen anymore, <laughs> <laughs> remember. Um, but that's, the, that's what's claimed to fame nowadays. Um, and this temple was built by Jaya Harman VII, the same guy who built Amkor Tom. And he, in, uh, in the construction of this temple, they installed this inscription that describes all, it actually gives a really detailed life of the temple and who was working there and who was involved in making sure the temple kept running. And it specifically described how 1,409 students and teachers lived on site together inside the temple enclosure. So that was one of the first, this is really one of the first indicators that temples are not just places of worship or even places of learning, that there are places where people could be living as well too, and that drove some of our research, as I'll show you. There's also uh, bas-reliefs on this temple of the Bayan that's in the center of Angkor Thom uh, that I showed you earlier. These show some scenes from daily life, so you can see a little bit of activities of people hanging out underneath the house, and this is people engaging in a pig fight, I believe. There's market scenes as well too, so it gives us a pretty good idea about um, one perspective on daily life in Cambodia, which is pretty interesting. Uh, and then there has been a little bit of archaeology. So this map that I showed you earlier is by my colleague Jacques Boucher. So he mapped all of this, but there's been almost no excavation, but it does give you an idea that there's people living in this area and living according to a grid system. They were also extending the runway at the Siem Reap Airport, and they did a salvage archaeology project. And in the process of doing that, they found some post holes that seemed to be related to a more rural style house or house compound as well. So we're getting a little bit from archaeology. But one of the big challenges is that places where we think people are living are covered by forest. And as I mentioned, a lot of the house structures where people are living are made out of organic materials. So that makes finding where people are living and doing these kinds of targeted excavations a lot more difficult. <coughs> How do we act, like accurately identify and then go in and excavate these places? And for that, we have some new technology. So um, I don't know if you've heard of LiDAR before. It's kind of been in the news. It's getting used a lot more frequently in archaeology all around the world. So LiDAR is essentially a laser scanner that you strap on, a, in this case, a helicopter, but you can put it on an airplane. And it, you fly it over an area and it just shoots out thousands, hundreds of thousands of laser points. They bounce down and hit the roofs of houses, they hit the trees, they hit the ground surface, and then return to the machine. And the machine's recording the rate of return, the angle of return, that kind of thing, and just creating this 3D landscape that looks a little bit like this. Because 
so many laser points are getting got out of the LiDAR machine, they can go in between the gaps in the leaves and the trees and hit the ground surface. So it's really uh, great for densely forested areas because you can do a LiDAR survey, get something like this. People have been doing LiDAR for a while now, so they have an idea about what a tree signature looks like. So you can peel the tree layer off of your return, your LiDAR return, and then get just the ground surface underneath. So for a place like Angkor Wat, what you can see is it's got the temple, central temple, and then this huge area surrounded by trees. We can peel the tree layer off and then look at the ground surface underneath. And what you should see here is this um, kind of waffly pattern around the temple. But like the map of Angkor Thom, is in a very nice arranged grid system where we have mounds and then next to the mounds we have depressions or ponds. So this is a really similar pattern to Angkor Thom, although this is even more organized. So this to us seemed like a place where people might be living around the temple. I will mention, my colleagues walked around here in 2010 before we had LiDAR data, and you can tell, you can tell the ground surface isn't completely flat, but it's so heavily forested, and frankly, there's a lot of monkeys, and so um, it's really not clear that how, how organized this is, how well planned, and we had no idea that this seemed to extend outside the moat too. So you can see over here is uh, right in line with this uh, part of the temple is another area of grid system of mounds and depressions. Also turned up this, which is still a bit of a question mark for us. Um, these square spirals actually extend down this way. And um, our working hypothesis is that it's some kind of garden, kind of like the gardens at Versailles, the labyrinths, that kind of thing. Uh, although we're still investigating that. Uh, okay, so now you can see, we can see that there are these mounts around Angkor Wat and this is a place that we wanted to investigate habitation. There are a few reasons why. Um, Angkor Wat was a temple that was actually never abandoned in its entire uh, lifetime. There seemed to have always been people around worshiping at the temple, modifying it. And so we suspected that we would have a pretty good chance of finding a long series of habitation in these mounds. And that could tell us about change over time. It's a site, the landscape around the temple is fairly well preserved. It hasn't been too disturbed. Parts of the area closer to the temple now have like tourist stalls with selling t-shirts and some food. There's two Buddhist pagodas that are around this temple as well too. So parts of the landscape are a little bit disturbed, but some other parts of it are not, so it would be a good place for us to excavate. And it was a really important state temple, so we were very curious about who are the people that would be living here. Would they be elite people? Would they be people who worked in the temple? Are they completely unrelated to the functions of the temple? There are lots of interesting questions, and that uh, inscription from Toprom indicated that people were living inside